come on, church. Let's worship this morning. Put your hands together. We love you, Lord. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love.
Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Amen. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Amen. Worthy.
We're not done yet. Come on, let's worship Him this morning. Let's get back the wonder of knowing Jesus. See Him in your heart, seated on His throne, with eyes of fire, hair white like wool. Eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. It's so personal and so intimate with our hearts. Yes, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. I'm filled with wonder. Come on. Filled with wonder. Awestruck wonder. At the mention of your name. Come on, declare it. Jesus, your name is power. Breath in living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. If you have your Bible, we're going to ask you to open it up <clears throat> to the third chapter of the book of the Revelation. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 13 this morning. And while you're turning that, we're going to give you just a quick review, just a, like a one-sentence synopsis of every one of the characters. We see that the book of the Revelation is to encourage us, not to discourage us, not to scare us, but to show us that God is sovereign. God has a commensurate consummation plan and that he's uh, this is world's not spinning out of control that he's sovereign he's governing in the affairs of men <clears throat> and he's coming back and he's so gracious and so merciful that he tells people <clears throat> not just saved people but lost people that he's coming back so that they could be saved and so at the church of Ephesus we see the careless church they left their first love the church of Smyrna the crushed church the church that was <clears throat> intensely persecuted. The church at Pergamum, the compromising church, the church that tolerated sin in its midst. The church at Thyatira was the corrupt church. They tolerated Jezebel's doctrine. The church at Sardis was the crippled church. They had a reputation that they were well, but they were dead. <clears throat> and now, the sixth church out of seven, we have the church at Philadelphia, which is the committed church. The committed church, the evangelizing church, the missionary church. <clears throat> and God has something particular. Excuse me, let me clear my voice. And God has something particular to this church that he did not promise to any other church. And we're going to look at that closely this morning. And so before we get started, let's just read the scripture. Uh, Revelation 3, 7 through 13. <clears throat> and to the church, uh, to the angel of the church 
in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. <clears throat> Indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm going to choke to death. <clears throat> Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. <clears throat> I will write on him the name of my God and the new name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has ears, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the promise of your return. And Father, help us to see this morning as we look at this church that we too can be this church. And see, Father God, that you have uh, the authority to open and close doors. And you set before churches open doors. And we pray now, God, that we would see them and step through them and be used by you and utilized by you in this world today for your kingdom purposes, to make an eternal difference in just a little space of time. We ask it now, God, enlighten us. Let us have the ear to hear what your spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Philadelphia. Y'all know the name of the word, right? Brotherly love. This, we have a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's what the word Philadelphia means, brotherly love. <clears throat> and we got that from this. And what Philadelphia, Philadelphia, we know that it means brotherly love, but where did Philadelphia come from? Well, this city was established by a king who had for his brother. And he created it as a missionary, not, not in the biblical sense, but as a mission outpost city to have an influence on the region for Greek culture. He gave it to his brother of whom he had great love, or for whom he had great love, and his name, the, the king's nickname was Philadelphus. Philadelphus, because he loved his brother so much. So when he gave his brother <clears throat> this city, his brother turned around and named it after his brother that gave it to him, Philadelphia. <clears throat> no, I don't need that. It'll, it'll, it'll be worse, thank you. I, I had one of those before I started. Mm. But thank you for your help. <clears throat> now, the most important thing about that is, is that the city was created to have an impact. <clears throat> it was given to him to influence the region. Uh, for the Greek culture. And it did such a good job that within a few years, everyone in that area, instead of speaking their native language, was speaking Greek. They had a tremendous impact. So it's not ironic that God singles out this particular church that says not only has it been placed here by man to have an impact for culture, but it's been placed here by God to have an impact for the kingdom to have an impact for Christ. And it was singled out, and it's the smallest of all the cities. It was probably be looked at as probably the most insignificant. It's not the poorest, but it was, it was close to it. And so God's desire for us is the same as it was in the intention of the church at Philadelphia, and that is to be a mission, to have an impact for the kingdom. Look at 1 Peter 2 and 9. 1 Peter 2 and 9. 
It's up on the screen. But you are, who is you? The believers. And we are the church of the living God. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Now, the reason that he gives us all of that is for our identity. But it's not for us to sit around in tie-dyed T-shirts holding hands around a campfire singing Kumbaya. He tells us that because we have a purpose. And here's the purpose after the comma. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's why we are here. And that's why God has placed us on this planet. We are to be the church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was successful in reaching the community for Greek culture, but it was also noted by Christ as a little bitty insignificant body of believers that were being utilized to greatly influence the entire region for the kingdom of Christ. Now let's look at verse 7. As Jesus presents himself, we've, we've pointed out that in every one of these instances where the introduction of the letter, <clears throat> Christ presents himself in a certain way. And that the presentation of himself is to help set the tone for what he is about to say in the body of the letter. In other words, the preamble to the letter is setting the stage for the body of the letter. And so when, uh, in all of the instances of these churches, except for here, he's referring back to chapter 1, the picture that John had as Jesus presented himself to John before he began to dictate the letters. But here we have reference to something completely different. He's going to go all the way back to the Old Testament. He's going to go all the way back and give some references to himself. He's going to reveal himself later in Revelation chapter 4, and he's also going to, he has revealed himself in the epistles of 1 John. We'll go there in just a second. And all the way back into Isaiah, he's presenting himself. Now here's what he says. This says he who is holy. Now let's just stop there. Well, holy, true, and the one who has the key of David. Holy, true, and the one who has the key of David. Now, here's something I want you to get. I want you to write down out beside verse 7 in your Bible, holy, or either underline it or highlight it, because that's the key to this verse. And I want you to understand something with regards to the holiness of God. There's a lot of things, even in these verses that we're looking at, and certainly all through the Bible, that, that give to us an understanding of the character of God. That something of the understanding of the power of God and the wisdom of God and so forth and so on. But I want you to understand this, that every other characteristic of God, whether it be, be sovereignty or wisdom or mercy or grace, all of that emanates from His holiness. In other words, he's not, God is not love who happens to be holy. God is not merciful who happens to be holy. God is not sovereign, who, by the way, is holy. God is holy, who is sovereign. God is holy, who is merciful. God is holy, who loves. But He is holy. Not only do do you need to understand that because that's what the Bible teaches and I'm telling you, but it's the only place in Scripture, and we're going to go there in, in Revelation 4 and 8, where it is emphasized three times. I want to look, I want you to pull that up if you will. The four living creatures, this is, this, this is a, in, the next couple of, in the next chapter. We're going to look at it right now. John has been escorted into heaven in the vision. He says, here's what I see. Four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest. They are not saying, merciful, merciful, merciful is our God. No. Wisdom, wise and knowledgeable is our God. No. Loving and intimate and... Beautiful is our God. No. What are they saying in heaven? Holy, holy, holy. Lord, that's sovereign. God, that's only almighty, all-powerful. Who was and is and is to come, eternal. Holy, holy. Out of that, the word holy, if you look it up and, and break it down to its lowest common denominator, here's what holiness means. Uniquely 
unique. Not another like it. The original. No copies. Cannot be duplicated, replicated. The one and the only. He said, he, so he's saying, I'm writing you a letter, church, and you need to know that it's coming from the real deal. Uh, this is not secondhand news. The one that's writing this letter to you is the one who is holy. The one who is uniquely unique. The one who is like any other. Let's look at uh, 1 John 2 and, uh, no, I'll get to that with truth. Let's go to Isaiah 43, 15, Shannon, if you don't mind. He's going back now and he's revealing himself with regards to the Old Testament scripture. Look what he says. I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Look at that. Lord, holy creator, king. He's referring them back to this. Now, God, this is, this is why this is so important. Because in every church, I don't care where it is, almost every church chooses to select and highlight and dwell on certain characteristics of God. Uh, you, and I'm, I'm not going to even name, I was going to give some examples, but <clears throat> I'm not going to even go there. But everyone likes to pick out a certain aspect of God that they like. To the exclusion of this one. We serve a holy God. It's not the absence of sin because God was holy before there was sin. It's something that we do not understand. Our minds cannot grasp. He is so high, so holy, so unique, so impossibly alone in his uniqueness and in his person. That, that's why nobody's going to run up to Jesus in heaven and sit in his lap. He's just not going to do it. Nowhere is that depicted in Scripture. You're not going to go up there and high-five him. You're not going to go up there and say, Sup, cuz. not going to go up there and say, I got a question for you. Where's my Meemaw? Where's my Pawpaw? Why did this happen? No. He is going to be so... And the reason... And the word glory simply means the brightness that comes out of his uniqueness. You cannot describe it. It's just the, the pureness of God. Just the, the unique uniqueness of God. Just in his aloneness. Just in his, his being. It's just emanating. That's called the glory. And when you and I see the glory. Ain't nobody high-fiving and sliding in there. Ain't nobody driving no 43 race car. Ain't nobody going up there to pour out the rain. When you and I see the Holy One of Israel, when you and I see the, the, the one who is alone in his person, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. You say, Brother Andy, it's just not my nature to be loud. Oh, you're going to get loud. You're going to get low and loud because you and I are going to come into contact with the Holy One. And he's, so, so let's go now, let's move to, he says that I'm, um, uh, I have the key of David, Isaiah 22, 2, 20, uh, 22, 22. I'll go back up in just a second to the other one, Shannon, thank you. The key of the house of David, this is Isaiah, I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Now, in context, this verse was written about a guy named Eliakim. Eliakim was going to come into a position because God was going to get rid of someone else who was not uh, honoring and obeying God. And so this person was going to be cast out into utter darkness, literally. And Eliakim was going to step into the kingship. He was going to take over the authority of Israel. And here's what God said. With regards to his authority, I will let the key of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. David was the first, uh, was the, the, the king from whom the promised Messiah would come. 
So this is not only talking about Eliakim in context, but it's talking about Christ in prophecy. Remember that it said in Isaiah that uh, of his kingdom there will be no end. He will rule them with a rod of iron. I will lay upon him the, the government upon his shoulders. What he's talking about here, the key of David, of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder, is meaning that he has all authority. He's the one who opens and closes the door. Now, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. So he's saying, I'm the Holy One and that I have all authority. And then he goes on and he says, I'm also the one who's true. Look at 1 John 2 and 20 through 23. But you have an anointing from the... There's that word again. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who, has, he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So when Jesus says, I'm the true one, the holy one, and I have the key of David, what he's saying is, I'm the true and the living God. Now, he's reminding them of that because he is telling them that I am the one who has the authority to open doors of opportunity in the kingdom of God. And I have the, the authority to open doors of opportunity and to close them in the kingdom of men. I am the true and the living God. And guys, listen, you just need to grab a hold of this. Uh, to all you young people that are going to go to school and people are going to try to talk you out of Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> listen, you have to choose whether or not you believe these, these verses. If you run up on some sort of religion or some sort of doctrine or some sort of church or some sort of preacher or some sort of Bible study or some sort of spirit that denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God the Savior of the world and the Creator and the Sustainer of all things, you have run upon a lie and you are not listening to the one true holy God. So he's, 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 he's encouraging them with his presence. Now let's look at verse 8. I know your works. Well, what are they? Well, he knows everyone's works. In every church he says, I know your works. I know your works, I know your works, I know your works. He's telling Randy Fuller, I know your works. He's telling you, I know your works. And he's telling us, he knows our works as a church. And he says, I know your works. And he says, I, have, I know your works. See, see, this is a word that ties. See, I have set before you an open door. In other words, this church, God, God has a, 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 a mission for this church. And he knows that they are mission-minded. See, he says, I know your works. And then at the end of that period, see, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. In other words, he's tying their works that he has observed with an open door. And he's making the correlation that they need to look at the opportunities that he continues to give to them. He did not say, I am opening a door. He says, I have set before you an open door. In other words, it's there right now. And he's saying that what you are doing, what I am observing in your life, I am responding to that by already having opened a door for you. Now, doorways in this context is opportunity. Somebody say doorways are opportunities. Doorways are opportunities. And he says, I have set before you an open door door in other words an open op opportunity and now here's what he says listen guys no one can shut it Jesus has the authority to give and to restrain opportunities here's what that means for us as a church and here's what that means for you you don't need and I don't need and we don't need anything but Jesus, to give us an opportunity. You don't need a favor. You don't need something else. The only thing that dictates opportunity in your life is Jesus Christ. 
You don't have to be a certain color. You don't have to have a certain amount of money. You don't have to live in a certain part of town. You don't have to be from a certain church. You don't have to be from a certain denomination. You don't have to live in a certain country or nation. Anywhere, everywhere, and to anyone and everyone, God has the authority to give you opportunity. Now, we ought to be excited about that. We ought to be excited about that in our personal lives and in our spiritual lives. No one can shut it. God gives us opportunities to be saved. No one can shut that door but God. No one can open that door but God. That's why he said today is the day of salvation because he didn't say how long he was going to keep the door open. But you can't come into the presence of God without opportunity and permission. You and I can't be saved any old time we want to. We have to be saved during the time of opportunity. I'm going to say it again. You can't get saved any time you want to. You have to get saved during the time of opportunity. Now, who is the only one who has the authority over the door? You, your mama, your papa, your, your preacher? No. The door is opened and closed by the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now. He opens the door for ministry, for missions, for witnessing. He opens the door personally for jobs, careers, positions, and abilities. And then he says, see, I have set before you an open door. What does he mean, see? He doesn't mean just see with these eyes. Of course, Jesus said that the eyes are the doorway to the soul. But it's not just, you're not going to just see the opportunities with your eyes. You're going to have to see the opportunity with the eye of faith. You're going to have to see in the Spirit. God will put something in front of you, and you won't realize it's a door if you're not mission-minded. If you're not looking. He said, see, I've set before you an open door. Well, what he's, in, what he's inferring is, is that there's an open door there, and most oftentimes we don't see it. Why? Because we're not looking, and we're not asking. And we're not seeking. And we're not knocking. Jesus said, if you'll knock, I'll answer. If you'll seek, you'll find. If you'll ask, it'll be given to you. And the church today is asking and seeking and knocking for more of this, more of that, and more of that. But no one is seeking, asking, and knocking for opportunities in the kingdom. And he's saying, see, I've created an opportunity. Now you're going to have to walk. It's not The opportunity's there, but you've got to walk through it. And we're not seeing it. An open door of opportunity. See. Are we looking? Are we listening? Are we asking? Are we knocking? Let me tell you, just briefly, I, haven't, I mentioned this to my family. This, I got a call. The other day, I'm just sharing this with the church because I think in my spirit, that's what we see with, that God has opened a door of opportunity for our church. Now, I haven't discussed this with the elders. I haven't discussed this with anyone but a few people in my family. But I got a call the other day from Samaritan's Purse. Lynn Renstra, who's been here before to speak with us, she deals with our region. She pays a lot of attention to this church because this church is a giving church and has given a lot of money to Samaritan's Purse. I don't say that to brag. I say that to say because you guys are givers. And givers get God's attention. So she calls me. She says, Randy, I have something that I think you might be interested in. Boom. She said, you know that Samaritan's Purse was involved kind of off the radar with evacuating Many of the African refugees. We used Samaritan's Purse planes. We took thousands of people off out of Afghanistan. And she says, right now, on American military bases, there are 60 plus thousand African refugees that we have taken, that the United States has removed, and they are housed on military bases. All of them are, have been vetted. Take that for what it's worth. But Samaritan's Purse is not vetting them, so you just take that for what it's worth. 
They all are here legally. They're going to have a blue card able to work. Some of them speak English. Some of them speak very good English. Some of them speak no English. There are doctors, attorneys, school teachers, and farmers, and unemployed. But they have left everything in their country. They reside on the military bases with nothing but the clothes on their back. We've been asked by the federal government if we would help them assimilate these people back into our culture. Now, I know what you're going to say. Oh, my God. You want us to take a bunch of Africans and plug them into Alabama. How can we trust them? Well, let me ask you this. How do you trust anybody? Here's the deal. Someone is going to assimilate them. Would you rather it be someone who is lost or someone who is saved? Would you want it to be someone who's salt or someone who's not? Would you want it to be someone who's light or someone who's not? Because they are here and they are not leaving. So we have an opportunity to be the voice, the light, and the salt of Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to debunk all that they've ever heard about America. Can't trust Americans. Can't trust Christian Americans. All right? And that they will use you. They will be so forth and so on. And we have the chance for them to say, I know what I've heard. I know what I've read. But that has not been my experience with the people who call themselves Christian. We have that opportunity. What they are asking is that at least five families be involved in every church to assimilate two families of Africans. They're going to send them together to each community so that they will know someone else that's an African. They're going to need a place to stay and a job. They'll have the cards to be able to work. They're going to need to have English as a second language. They're going to have to immediately be taken to Walmart and given some, bought some clothes and shown you know, help them get a driver's license, show them where, you know, some opportunities to find work. And we have people that, that can do that. <clears throat> if you have rental property and it's not occupied, we could use it. So my point is this. God has opened the door of opportunity for you and I to be involved in international mission to Afghanistan and is willing to walk them through that door. You don't have to go anywhere. God will bring the world has br is bringing the world to you. I know you say, "Well, I can't go to Afghanistan. It's dangerous in Afghanistan. I'm not flying with a mask. I'm not." He's gonna walk them through the door. Just sharing with you what I see. But he said, "You got to see it." Now, why is he doing this? Number one, he says, for you have little strength. You have little strength. What does that word strength mean? It means faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In other words, they were a small church, but they had faith. Little faith. And you go, how is he going to use them in a big way with little faith? Well, let's look at the verse. Matthew 17. Then the disciples came to him, to Jesus privately, and said, why could we not cast it out? What is it? It was a demon, a demon-possessed boy, that they couldn't cast the demon out of him. And Jesus said to them, they said, why couldn't we do it? And he said, because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mountain, no, he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus said, you, you're misinterpreting it. Even a little bit of faith is a mountain-moving faith. Just a little bit of faith. And he's telling this church, you guys are a small church, and you got a little bit of faith. Now, here's why I think he's saying that. Here's why I think he's saying that. Because in today's world, we have this idea that the church can only do in accordance with its own resources. In other words, this church is probably looking at itself. Man, we're like, we're like the little holiness church up there in Northside. We've got like 20 people. 
Half of them are unemployed. All of them are old. And none of us have much money. How can we, how can God use us in a big way? Well, what he's saying here is, guys, listen. I don't care how you look at your own situation. What I'm telling you is, is that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, i got a door of opportunity, and I promise you, if you'll take that faith as a mustard seed and walk through that door, I'll do kingdom-sized stuff with you. Me and you will do big things together. Stop looking at the decimal places in your bank account. And this goes for all of us individually. Stop limiting yourself, i.e. limiting God, i.e. missing opportunities, because it's not meshing up with what you think you need to have with what you think you have to have. Of the people that you got, you say, Pastor, it's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take a lot of money. You know, I say, I'm just asking for a, a mustard seed of faith. Somebody just walked through the door. You know how that starts? You know how it starts? By somebody saying, I'll do it. You got to make a decision to do it. It starts there. You don't say, well, if this lines up and if I get that, and if they will cooperate, and if I get one more other family to help me, and if I get, then, then I'll do it. No, no, that's not how it works. It says, I'll do it. And then God begins through that open door of opportunity to touch people's lives, and give. And they're going to take advantage of their opportunity and their resources. You say, Pastor Randy, I have no resources, I have no talent, don't have much time, I'm old and decrepit. Moses was 80 when he delivered a nation. He had no retirement program. He had no job except tending sheep for his father-in-law. He had already run from the place that God wanted him to go back to. He had a wanted poster with his picture still on it. And God said, hey, listen, I want you to go do this. And here's what he said. You got the wrong guy. I don't talk well. So God sent him an interpreter. And he said, I'm old. He said, what you got in your hand? He said, a stick. I'll use it and deliver Israel. None of you are coming to the table. None of us are coming to the table with less than what Moses had. And he delivered a nation. He just needed somebody to touch him on the shoulder and says, which by the way, the whole invitation to join him was revealed by the holiness of God in a burning bush. Maybe you and I need to have an encounter with the holiness of God so that we could stand up like Isaiah and say, here I am, Lord, send me. He said, you've kept my word. You've kept my word. You've been obedient. You've been doers of the word. Guys, listen, the word works when we work it. You've been doers of the word. That's important. This is what Jesus is telling them. He said, you got a little faith? You've kept my word, and lastly, he said, you have not denied my name. Well, now, why, why does he say you have not denied my name? Because he goes down here, look at verse, verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Now, we've already run into this bunch. These are Judaizers. You can go back in the Scriptures and look. These are people who thought that they were saved because they were Jewish, and because they kept the law. They did have faith in Christ, but they also felt like they had to keep the law at the same time. But Paul, in his writer, writings to the churches in the area of Galatia, told them this, you who seek to be uh, justified by the law have fallen from grace. You can't be saved by believing in Jesus and something else. That will leave you outside of the gates. You say, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in this. And you've got to do this before you can be saved. If the work of Christ and His resurrection is not enough, if you try to tack anything else on that, you're going to be left outside of the gates. It's Jesus' blood. It's Jesus' righteousness. It's Jesus' cross. It's Jesus' life. It's Jesus' death. It's Jesus' resurrection. It's Jesus' blood. That is the way, the truth, and the life. It's not baptism. It ain't speaking in tongues. It ain't missionary work. It's not member Bible memorization. It ain't driving the bus. It's not leaving a trust to the church. It's the blood 
of the Holy One of Israel. And he said, you've not denied my name. So what he's saying is, is that your resistance has come from people who call themselves Christians. Now you think about that. He said, the, you, you're, having to, you're having to push back on people. And here's what probably happened. This is just Randy's surmising. They probably got some folks saved and they started the church and the Jews said, uh, and, and one of these so-called Jews who said they got saved said, well, why don't we just meet in the synagogue? And so as they started meeting in the synagogue, then the Jews began to exert their Jewish influence and say, well, now all you, all you folks getting saved now, y'all got to keep the law and you got to keep the Sabbath and you know, and all that, and they said, "No, we're not going to do that. It's, it's Jesus' blood and His righteousness. I, 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 on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand." And they said, "Here's what they probably did. Well, you can't meet here. Well, you, you can't meet in the synagogue if you're not going to believe like we believe." So they they probably had to leave. That's why Jesus said, "I'm going to bring those." Randy's paraphrase. I'm going to bring those sap suckers. One of these days, back to your feet. I'm going to make them bow down and confess that I loved you. Them, I've never known. That's what he said. Is your greatest resistance to walking through the doors of opportunity with a little bit of faith that God has given you, is that coming from inside your house? Is that coming from your family? Is that coming from your child? Have you shared a dream? Have you shared an opportunity that God has shown to you and you shared it with somebody and somebody shot it down? They said, oh, can't do that. Nobody do that. Nobody does that these days. Are you crazy? And, and they just talked you right out of your dream. They just talked you right out of your vision. They just talked you right out of your mission. Talked you right out of your opportunity. You know why those people do that? Because they don't have the faith to go through with you, so they don't want you to go without them. They don't have the faith to go through with you. So let's just stay on the other side and play it safe. He said, you have indeed kept my name. You've kept my name against all resistance. Too often, and in doing so, he set before him an opportunity. Now, I'm going to share this with you. I added this to my message this morning as I received an encouraging text from someone who, who texts me every Sunday morning, a, a, a pastor, evangelist, dear friend of mine, every Sunday morning, words of encouragement and thoughtful things. And I said, oh, that's good. And I just put it down this morning. And he said this. He said, last night I watched a football team, talking about Alabama, struggle for an entire game because key pieces to their team were missing. They were, they were missing running backs, and then their starting running back got hurt. Their right tackle was failing, so they had to put in someone else. Their center was struggling with a high ankle sprain. They take him out, put in a guy who hadn't played yet. And he said, and because they were playing out of position, he said they struggled. But you know what happened when they plugged in those other pieces, those other people? For two minutes, they played lights out. Here's what he said. If your absence is not missed, then your presence didn't make a difference. I said, oh, God, that's good. I literally went to my phone and put in sermon ideas, great quotes from, and I put the person's name. I went right down there and put it. And then I shared it with another buddy of mine that I, we share back and forth with on Sunday morning. I'm going to say it again because this is all about showing up for the opportunity. And the church at Philadelphia showed up. We all can make excuses. Alabama could make excuse. We didn't have this person. We didn't have this person. This person was hurt. Hey, Auburn had some people missing. We had this person missing, this person missing. But it, hey, listen. The mission is not dependent upon any one person. It's dependent upon the team, which means next man up, which means that the guy that's playing center 
had an opportunity. He wasn't as big as the guy's place he took, wasn't as athletic, but the first play from scrimmage, he knocked the taste out of somebody's mouth and ran down the field 10 yards in front of the ball carrier and was trying to knock another guy out. He was riding the bench thinking that his day of opportunity would never come, certainly not in a game this big. And the next thing you know is the coach says, it's, it's your time up. And Jesus says, I've created for you an opportunity and you've got a little faith. You get your helmet and you get out there and whatever you have, you bring it all to the table and you blow and you go as hard as you can and your team, i.e. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost and all the other believers on the planet that God brings to bear <clears throat> will make sure that you get, the, you get the job done. Make sure that we get the job done. I'm going to say it again. If your absence is not missed, then your presence has had no impact. Ask yourself this question. Let's just put it in a secular light. If I couldn't go to work tomorrow, would that affect our company? If I, showed, if I didn't go back home to be the father to my children, would that make a difference? If I didn't stay with my wife, would that make a difference? Because, see, if you can leave and everything rolls on like it used to be, then while you were there, you were making no difference. If your absence is not missed, then your presence is having no impact. I read this story. This is not original. There's four church members in every church. Fred, somebody. Thomas, everybody. Susan, anybody. And Joe, nobody. They were all neighbors. They all went to church. They were a little bit odd. Difficult to understand. But they all went to the same church. But you would not have enjoyed going to church with them. Because everybody went fishing on Sunday, or stayed home to visit with friends. Anybody wanted to worship, but was afraid if they did, that somebody wouldn't speak to them. So guess who went to church? Nobody. Really, nobody was the only decent one of the four. Nobody did the visitation. Nobody worked on the church building. Once they needed a Sunday school teacher, and everybody thought that anybody would do it, and anybody thought that somebody would do it, but it wound up that nobody did it. That's exactly right. Nobody. And it happened that one time a fifth neighbor, <clears throat> an unbeliever, moved into the area and came to church. And everybody thought somebody would try to win them to Christ. Anybody could have made an effort, but nobody led him to Jesus. We need churches full of Joe Nobodies. We just need churches full of Joe Nobodies. Because anybody and everybody and somebody is busy. And nobody always does the work. It's pretty good, isn't it? I wish that was original, but we is not. So they had opposition. We've already explained that. But here's what he said. <clears throat> I'm going to open a door for you that nobody can shut. Last point. I'm going to open the door for you that nobody can shut. Why? Well, look at Proverbs 16, 7. It's going to come up right here. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. See, it's not about your, it's not about your contacts. It's not about who you know. The world says that it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Well, in a sense, that's true. If you know Jesus, you know everybody. He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. <clears throat> Let me just throw this back to you. Do you know how Israel, after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, got to go back to their land and rebuild a temple? Because God put it in the heart of a pagan king that says, let them go back. Just put it in his heart. 
Just woke up one day and said, let the Jews go back. Not only that, but when Nehemiah got ready to go, he said, he said sir, <clears throat> we have no possessions. We're Jews in the land of Babylon. We own nothing. If we're going to go back and rebuild that thing, we're going to need some transportation, some protection, and some money and some goods. You know what the king did? Gave it to him. You mean he didn't have to have a committee? No. Did they vote? No. They didn't have to know somebody, knew somebody that pulled some strings? No. They just told the king, hey, listen, we're going back, and this is what we need. So let it be written in the vo voice of Yule Brenner, let it be done. Literally. And so I'm saying all of this, the whole message is, is about this church at Philadelphia is, is, understands that they have a mission from God. And that God has created an opportunity. And that God has equipped them. And that even their enemies will be a part of God's plan in helping them to go forward if God so wills it to be done. Psalm 23 and 5. How about this? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God is the God of open doors. You don't need a friend. You don't need a hookup. You don't need a bro. You don't need... Anything except the willingness to go. A little bit of faith that will go through a door of opportunity. How many times have we heard the story that says, somebody says, Lord, I'll do it, but you're going to have to provide, and God did it. God's always faithful. Where he opens the door, he provides a way. Does he use other people? Absolutely. But we don't have to secure that. I told Bruce Plummer, Bruce Plummer said, Pastor Randy, I mean, he, he called me Randy. He said, Randy, he said, you know what God's done? I said, what? He said, God's laid it on my heart to give away 50,000 Bibles. Well, he'd already told me what they cost on Amazon, eight and a half dollars. I said, Bruce, you don't have to raise, I said, you don't have to raise uh, $475,000. He said, no, I'm not. God does. I'm supposed to give the Bibles away. God's got to get the money up. I sit there and I said, well, man, that's a cool way to think about it. Because I'd be thinking, that, my God, man, how am I going to get half a million dollars? Where am I going to get that kind of money? Bruce said, I mean, just that quick. I said, Bruce, you got to raise $400,000. He said, no, I don't. Just that quick. No, I don't. I'm passing the Bibles out. God's paying for the Bible. I mean... And you say, Pastor Reed, that's such a cool story. It could be your story. It could be my story. It could be our story. He said, here's the promise. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Well, y'all know what that is, right? The tribulation. He said, I'll keep you from it. Not in it, not through it, from it. Not in it, not through it, from it. Somebody say from. From, from, from. If I rescue you from a burning house, what am I going to do? I'm going to pick you up and get you out. Oh, I love that. People think we're in the tribulation. You ain't seen nothing yet. I ain't seen nothing yet. We're in, the, we're in the beginning of sorrows. We're in the woe is me time. We're in the whining time. We ain't got to squall it. It's coming. But listen, he, he, said, he said this, I'll keep you from the hour of trial. Well, they already knew. For him to keep you from the hour of trial, they had to know what the hour of trial was. They didn't say, now what is the hour of trial? Well, they already knew because they had been taught the scriptures. What is the hour of trial? And he says, it's not only going to come upon you. Somebody read this now. Help me with my... <clears throat> Understanding. He said, it's the time of trial which shall come upon the Alabama, the United States, Joe Biden. No. Come upon the whole world. Somebody say the whole world. The whole world. And why will it, why will it come upon the whole world to test them that dwell upon the earth? Well, if it's here, to, if it's to test the people that dwells upon the earth, on the earth, if, it, if it's a time of testing for all the people that dwell upon the and we're going to be kept from it, well, what's got to happen? We gone, baby. We gone. But he said, look, 
He said, Behold, I come quickly. Which talks about the imminence of his return. Which means that even here, as he's writing this some 2,000 years ago, as he was writing this, he said, I can come right now. He didn't say, no, y'all persevere, but don't get in a big hurry because it probably ain't coming for the next 2,500 years. He said, you need to pay attention to what I'm talking to you about because I could come any time. That's what makes the doorway of opportunity so important. Today, you and I are caught up in this, well, I have a plan too, and then God has a plan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work my plan until my plan has been worked, until I've kind of got no plan, I'm kind of to the end of my plan, and then I'll kind of start on God's plan. That's how we think, you know, when you're in high school, you think, man, I'll get my life right when I get out of high school. And then when you get in college, you say, man, I'll get my life right when I get out of college. Then you say, man, I'll get my life right when I get married. And then you say, God, I'll get my, well, we get our life right before we get married. We probably wouldn't be in the big position we are right now, but, um, and then we say, well, when I have children, and then I'm going to get my life right. And then you say, well, you know, after my kids are grown, you know, then I'll serve the Lord. And, you know, I'm going to get plugged in. And, and the next thing you know is at a time that you were least expecting it, either Jesus came and got you or you went to meet Jesus and you missed the opportunity. Not just to serve, but to be saved. Revelation 18.10. I got two, I'm going to two more places. I'm not going to go to the rapture verses. We've already studied that at length. I want to go to Revelation 18.10. Do you have that one, Shannon? Okay. I'll have to read that one in old school. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, your judgment has come. All through Scripture, when you see the word hour, it's, if it's not talking about time, like one hour out of 24, if it's talking about a segment of time, hour, you're looking at judgment. So when Jesus says, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the all, whole earth, you're looking at a segment of a time of judgment. And we see it right there in Revelation 18.10. Now, listen, I will, for in one hour, your judgment has come. Well, if we're going to be spared from the hour that's come upon the whole world to test, that means that the church of Philadelphia, you want to talk about motivation. The church of Philadelphia will not see that on the earth. The church of Philadelphia will not see that on the earth. He said, if you'll hold on and persevere, I'm going to give you three names. And I'm closing with this, three names. I'm going to write the name of my God on you, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. Well, what's the name of God? God. For In English version, Yahweh, in the Jewish, Jehovah, you know, so forth and so on. Okay. What's the name of the city of my God? Well, he named it. I will, give, I will write upon you the name of the city of my God. What is that? Jerusalem. We are the spiritual Jerusalem coming down out of heaven upon the new earth. Which, by the way, I want to just throw this in out there to you. The eternal future of the church is not in heaven, the third heaven. The eternal future of the church is heaven come down in a new heaven and a new earth. I know that bust up everybody's paradigm for heaven but there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth which means you're going to have a body which means that there's going to be relationships and work and fun and all that kind of stuff it's going to be Eden pre-fall just thought I'd throw that in there but look what he said and he said lastly I'm going to give you my new name did y'all know that Jesus has a name that you and I don't know Let's look at it. Stan, would you pull it up? Last verse. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. 
Jesus said, you stay the course. I'm going to give you three names. I'm going to inscribe them in your spirit, in your heart, on your forehead. I'm going to identify you. And your identity will be your security. You'll be like a pillar in my temple that will never be moved. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you access that no one else has. I'm going to give you the name that no one knows except me. You see that our worship today is incomplete because we don't even know who we're worshiping, really. We know he's holy. We know he's sovereign. We know he's good. We know he's gracious. But he's got names that we don't even know yet. But here's the one you need to be concerned with. When he comes back, he's going to have eyes like a flame of fire. He's going to have a vesture dipped in blood, and he'll have that on his... You read the 19th chapter, it says name about a dozen times. He has your name written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords, and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword with which he shall strike the nation. That Jesus is coming back. And he said, if you and I trust him and have a little bit of faith, keep his name, and walk through the doors of opportunity, You'll never have to fear him in judgment. You can embrace him as your conquering king. Behold, I set before you an open door that no man can shut and neither can any man open. Hold fast to what you have. Let no 